this book way, 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 way too much. If you talk to any of my colleagues or any other rhetoricians, they'll probably say there's something wrong with him. But this book is really important for our conversation in our course right now about audience. So who is the audience and how do you know? This is a big question and it's the question that animates all of rhetoric discussion uh, throughout history. The philosophy critique of rhetoric is, I think, a good place to start. And that starts with Plato, where the critique of traditional rhetoric is, you are more interested in being effective than you are with the truth. And to a certain extent, uh, that is kind of what the sophists were doing. They were professionals who were interested in effective argumentation, and they would always look for effective argumentation. But this doesn't mean that Plato's critique is correct. Sometimes I'll use the word efficacious in this class. And what that means is any kind of um, focus on what works. So the philosophical critique of rhetoric is that the efficacious takes priority over the truth. Now, when we examine this argument, we can see that, yeah, that, that's a risk that could happen. But is it necessarily true? And the answer is no. In fact, what we find more often than not is a world full of polarizing truths, that is, people who've done ample research, have thought carefully about a topic, and who want others to follow them and believe them, uh, find many different polarizing perspectives and polarizing uh, ideas and approaches. Uh, what do we do in that situation? Well, we have to rely on rhetoric to take what interpretation or what perspective on this thing works in order to hopefully move them towards the conclusion that is good for them or for everyone. Uh, efficacious doesn't necessarily mean selfish either. That's another problem with the critique is oftentimes when we hear what's effective, we think of the individual and selfishness, but it also might be that my selfish desires or my passion benefit the community or benefit the context or benefit the situation that we're in. So this traditional platonic critique of rhetoric is kind of weak. Uh, it does hold into account for the worst possible people, but you can't take that very narrow band of people who are only interested in winning. Uh, the word for that is heuristics. They're just interested in winning arguments for the sake of winning them, and then generalize that to everyone who practices rhetoric. It's uh, not a good way of thinking, and I don't even think Platonists would support that uh, mode of thinking. So now... Uh, we're left with the question, well, then how do you do this well? How do you do rhetoric in a way to make sure that you're not doing that? And that's where this book comes in, The New Rhetoric. This book was written in the 1950s, and it was sort of written as a response to what uh, they thought, and I think many people thought was a failure of philosophy, to provide a critical thinking system or a way of thinking about persuasion, how it works, how to theorize about it, so that we can teach people how to argue and make sure that they are assenting or agreeing to arguments that are good. How do they see through uh, deceptive or unethical practices. Uh, deception might not be unethical. That's another issue that we can talk about in another video. If you're curious about that, you can leave something on the Discord about that. Uh, we can talk about it. Uh, but for the purposes of this unit, that we're talking about audience, I want you to think about what audience is and how you would operationalize and reach your audience in argument. What are the best practices to do that? And how do we do it? In this book, what Perlman and Ulbricht Stittich are doing is trying to create an inductive appeal of how people argue every day that jives with or centers with or riffs with, it works with, the way that ancient rhetoricians thought about the art of rhetoric, which is audience-centered. So they make the claim that the only measure of a good argument is whether or not the audience uh, is into it. Is it effective for the audience? Now, I don't know what effective means, and maybe some people out there who know a little bit more about Perlman and Ulbricht Stitica than I do can correct me, but I don't think that effective arguments means the audience agrees with it. For me, I think an effective argument is one where the audience recognizes it as potentially persuasive, they understand it, they're moved by it, and then they can still choose to say no, or they can find some other issue with it. What the rhetorician's job is, or what the arguer's job is, is to minimize those pathways away from the argument to where the audience is sort of left with it to say, uh, yeah, okay, well then I'm persuaded then if all those other questions are answered. And when you have an audience in front of you, who knows what their questions might be, and it's very difficult to predict what possible pathways away they might have. However, I think in the art of rhetoric, one can do a pretty good job of making arguments that are both appealing, recognizably persuasive, recognizably good, and will do a pretty good job of moving the audience. Successful argumentation isn't winning every time. 
successful argumentation is creating an argument that people can opt into for good reasons, not because they are um, overcome with emotion, not because they have zero emotion, uh, not because they don't have a choice or, or anything like that. So uh, inductively, they look to a number of different examples um, for this. Uh, a lot of the examples in the book don't make a lot of sense because they're very old, but they're philosophers. So a lot of the stuff they're looking at in the section I gave you to read are things by Kant and things by uh, uh, Rene Descartes and people like that. But we don't have to go into too many specifics in this video. I just want to give you an orientation to what they're doing. So the first thing they're doing is talking about how people commonly use the terms persuade and convince. Now, this doesn't seem like such a big deal, but when you think about it, it really says something about who we're imagining that our words are impacting and influencing when we make them. When we go out to argue, we've got to present an argument. Remember the Joseph Wenzel piece where argument can be a product or a thing that we offer to other people, not necessarily a thing we do to other people. When we prepare an argument or we prepare to argue, that's a weird way to say argument, what we are doing is we imagine an audience. Now, the difference between persuasion and conviction, according to them, is that conviction usually refers to arguments that we feel there's really no way out of, that any reasonable person who hears them would be moved by them, and they would assent to them. Persuasion means I was moved by these arguments, but it doesn't necessarily mean that other people would have been. So it's kind of, for them, they articulate it as the difference between saying this moved me, but not might not necessarily move you, and this ought to move everyone. So it's a di distinction of the normative, that is, what ought to happen versus maybe what did happen is another way to think about it. So this gets them to think about the writing of philosophy and the writing of a lot of texts. Maybe every text you've ever read in college is kind of like this, where it tries to write in a way to where if anyone encountered it, they would accept it or they would understand it. And this is kind of where they start to talk about how people write in a way to where they think any reasonable person will come along, they'll accept it, or they will be unable to deny the force of their words. And this is the start of the universal audience theory. The universal audience isn't a real audience at all, and it doesn't refer to any actual audience you'd ever encounter. What it refers to is in your mind, when you're thinking about making arguments, who is it you're imagining is listening to them, and how do you know that those arguments would be good? So oftentimes when we're writing a paper, or we're trying to write that text to somebody or that email to somebody, we have a very specific person we're communicating with. And we're saying, okay, this is what's going to make my professor give me an extension, or this is what's going to explain my absence, or this is what's going to explain to my friend why I ditched them when I should have gone out with them Saturday, or whatever your issue is where you're trying to make an argument to sort of justify what you're doing. Or this will convince my friends that I'm right about this or that movie, or the Joker movie is really bad or really good, or whatever it is you're fighting about right now with your friends. Um, if you don't have that, if you're just writing a piece like to a newspaper, or if you're writing a paper that could be read by anyone, or you're writing a magazine article, you're writing a blog, or you're doing a, a speech for this uh, for uh, my class where we do the, the um, podcasts and stuff, um, you don't really know who's listening. So how do you imagine who that is? So they say the universal audience is based on the audience that you've had experience with. Who are the people who are most likely to read or look at this thing or engage with this thing? That's the audience that's really going to be there. What you do then to check yourself to make sure you're not doing something tricky or just appealing directly to them or pandering to them or just using the efficacious argument, the argument that's going to win without consideration for the ethical, uh, the ethical responses or anything like that. Um, you imagine this universal audience, which is that exp exposure you've had to different people and the kinds of thinking that you think are respectful, uh, reasonable. They are, um, they consider and follow the ways of thinking that you think are best. And they are not going to be, um, happy if you just say something to that very specific audience, because they might not be a part of that specific audience. Um, so that's what the universal audience model is. Every culture and every time period and every group of people have their own conception of the universal audience. That's what they say in the book. Uh, they said it would be really cool to study that because we would see what counts as reasonable as we move through cultures, as we move through times, as we move through places. This is very confusing to people because when you say universal audience, you would think it's everyone. But it's really everyone for us as limited, contingent beings who are products of our time and our space and our place. We cannot speak for everyone. We cannot speak uh, completely objectively for all people. But what we can do is we can have fidelity 
instead of to our specific audience and what trick would work for them, we can have fidelity to a mode of reasoning and thinking that we think of as an ideal, and we can speak to that. Now, problems with speaking to an ideal are many. The first is, what if the particular audience doesn't recognize it? What if you're speaking in such a fancy way, in such a high-level way, that the audience can't connect to it, they can't identify with it? Perlman and Ulrich Stitica say this is when you're speaking to a vanguard audience. They mention that in the reading. A vanguard audience is one that looks like the way everyone should think, but everyone doesn't think that way because it's a very specialized and specific audience that's had very specific training. And although you might wish everyone thought with that incredibly um, high, I mean, I don't like to use the word high because it makes it seem like it's better. It's just different. That different mode of speaking, uh, that particular mode of speaking for that community and what they feel they're doing, there's no need for that to be globalized. And to assume it's globalized and to assume it's best is to leave your particular audience behind. So that's the first mistake you can make is speak to too high of an ideal, like speaking as if everyone's a scientist or speaking as everyone is an attorney or everybody is an expert in politics. That's going to leave people behind. It's going to fail. Uh, it's not going to be efficacious and the audience is going to think you're dismissing them as idiots. The second problem that can happen is if your universal audience is too close to the particular audience. That is, it's too much like them and you get into things like pandering or using arguments that are really questionable that they would believe as the foundation for your arguments. That's called trickery or deception. We don't want to base argumentation on that. That's why the universal audience is there to make sure we're not constantly tricking because if you make that argument a little bit higher than the way the audience thinks now, or a little bit better, or a little bit more universal, you check back for the concern that there might be somebody there who doesn't buy into the culture. There might be some people there who realize it's just sort of a performed front of cultural norms, and they're like, well, yeah, but we really don't think that way. Or there might be people who consider it insulting, or there are people who actually know more than you do about the issue. You always have to assume that. When you're going to go in and argue always assume that someone in your audience knows a bit more about it than you do. And you'll be kind of safe for uh, making these kind of arguments. But that trick that I've always used that trick, uh, thinking about the audience and someone there knowing a little bit more than you do, is a way of doing universal audience. So I always assume uh, they've had really valid life experiences that I should not dismiss. Uh, so I shouldn't use things like, well, obviously everyone has had this experience or obviously everyone knows. I should avoid that because that's much too particular and might be pandering, might be thought of as insulting, or might be thought of me talking down to them. Uh, the second thing is I always assume someone knows more than me who's out in the audience and can influence others. After the fact, I only get a few minutes to argue with them. What are they going to do next? What are they going to do after that? And finally, the last thing is I assume they have a position on this in some way, and I'm not the sole person providing them information. They're getting information from all kinds of other sources. We live in an information glut society. And there's really no escape from it. Uh, it's everywhere. We're always getting information about everything all the time. Whether we want it or not, we're hearing about it. And this causes us a lot of stress, especially with politics and things like that. And we try to avoid it, but we really can't. It's just everywhere. It's a, it's a mass marketing consumer product uh, is what American politics is right now. So hard to avoid. So those are my assumptions for my universal audience. So I argue in a way of thinking people who care, who might know a little bit more than me, what would they want to hear? And this way, it's recognizable to that audience who it is I'm speaking to, and they too can imagine that person sitting right next to them. They too can imagine those people being in that audience with them. And it becomes a recognizable and maybe even an attractive way to think. People are not set in stone. People change their minds all the time. People are intersections of numerous identities that ebb and flow. Some come to the surface. Some are pushed down based on the situation people are in. Clusters of them rise, clusters of them fall. We are all intersections of numerous identities that we take on in daily life. As a rhetor, the universal audience is a powerful way to encourage them to put on and bring forward those identities that will make them clear and reasonable thinkers and people who you want to pursue and persuade that you have a really good idea. So that's the theory of the universal audience. Now, the last confusing thing about the reading was their idea of the undefined universal audience. The undefined universal audience goes back to that check I was talking about, about the two extremes that you can have when you're using the universal audience, the vanguard audience and pandering. The undefined universal audience is your way to check and see if your universal audience makes sense. 
So what you do is you think about the audience you're writing to and you say, is this audience the best one that other people might come up with? If the answer is no, if the undefined universal audience, which is a group of people who like to think about audience and argument, maybe other members of this class or people like me, other kinds of rhetoric uh, professors, if that un undefined universal audience says this is too elite or this is too base, then you might want to abandon that line of argument and think about addressing the audience another way. That's what the undefined universal audience is, is judgment on the quality of your universal audience. Is it actually helping you or is it getting you into trouble with your argument? So I think that's a pretty good video for unit two and the most difficult reading in unit two. The other readings are riffing off of and talking about universal audience. I read this book when I was an undergraduate just like you are right now. I mean, I'm assuming you're in my class watching this, but I read this book as undergrad and it really changed my thinking about argumentation in a way I've, I've never stopped thinking about it since that time, since like whenever I bought this book, 90, 96, I think. Um, this is the same one I bought it at Texas A&M where I was a student. And it's still hold, holding together pretty well. I think I need to read it more seriously and harshly and really kind of tear it up and make it look like a weathered uh, tome. Uh, but then I have to buy a new one. It really changed my way of thinking. And universal audience is one of these uh, concepts that I think about just about every day. Am I short-selling them? Am I being snooty to them or pedantic to them? Or am I speaking in a way that makes them think that they cannot participate in the conversation, that these lofty thoughts are way beyond them? All of these are mistakes with audience. All of these are mistakes with universal audience. And the universal audience is there to make sure that you show the audience you respect them, and that you have a conception of audience that they also share of what a really good audience is, what it means to think, what it means to consider issues carefully, and that you're there to include them in your argument, not to just hit them with a bat of facts or the truth or whatever passes for argument in our horrible, horrible, uh, rhetorically deprived society that we have right now. So let me know if you have questions. Email me, Skype me at Steviano. Or you can get on the Discord and ask questions about the Unit 2 readings. Look forward to reading your papers in about uh, four or five days. And uh, I will see you in the next video for Unit 3.